All right, hello, students. Uh, I have had a day, let me tell you. So, even though I only had to go across campus, I just finished giving an exam. <clears throat> and so now it's nice to be here at our fireside chat, uh, which, as you know, are, are these little small get togethers where you and I can kind of hang out in a residence hall in a small kitchen, a very laid back environment. So it's nice I could lose the coat and tie. Um, and so it's nice, so we have about two hours. Um, we're going to bake about four different batches of cookies. We're going to talk a lot about economics and research and things along the way. Um, and so feel free to interrupt me at any time. Again, this is very informal, very laid back, and we have like all night. I don't have anywhere I have to be. This is great. What? What, 15, 20 minutes? Okay, all right, well, uh, okay, so uh, slight change of plans. We, we might not actually be baking cookies then uh, if we have 20 minutes because they usually take about 12, 15 minutes to bake. Um, so uh, maybe we should talk more about how to bake cookies. Um, so when you make cookies, class or students of various backgrounds, I, I recognize a couple of you from, from uh, our exam earlier today. Um, but most of you are unfamiliar, so, so a lot of you haven't probably studied economics, um, so you might be sort of hearing about this econ stuff for the first time, probably heard rumors about calculus and graphs and marginal stuff and all sorts of scary quantitative things, um, but I'm here to tell you that economics is a very user-friendly sort of thing. So what do we need to bake cookies? And this is the time for you children to, uh, to participate, so what do we need? Uh, in this last session of the day, besides Eric's. Uh, what do we need to make cookies? Butter, good, that's a very important. Sugar, oven, hey, look at that, okay, so that's sort of thinking outside the box, right? So it's not only the straightforward ingredients, but also these other sort of inputs, we call them in economics, uh, that you might mix together in, a, in an interesting way. Um, so I have uh, brought some of these inputs, um, so we have our, uh, we have our oats, because we're making oatmeal cookies uh, today, um, and our flour, and our sugar, um, and our light brown sugar, and our dark brown sugar. Those are all important. Um, we, have some, uh, we have some raisins. Let's see here, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We have some uh, baking soda. Um, and uh, another thing that we need to uh, use are some like utensils, right? We were going to need cups and spoons and, and knives and, uh, and flippers and all sorts of great stuff up here. Okay, uh, we have some eggs and the butter is already in the bowl. So that's, uh, that's all set to go. Um, and finally, we're going to have to do some baking eventually. So we have all these inputs and you might look at these and say, okay, well, we're all ready to go. Um, but one, th I, I don't think, uh, so what do we need to make cookies again? We, so we have like all the ingredients. We need an oven, we need utensils, and what else? A recipe. A recipe. Oh, very good. Interesting, interesting. Uh, recipes. So back in the day when I was a kid, like recipes were like something you had to like hunt for and find. You could go to the store and get a, a cookbook, but at least in my family, recipes were handed down sort of from grandma to ma to me. Um, and, um, and recipes, uh, and economists would often think of these things as sort of like a technology. It, it's, it shows us a, um, a special way of doing things that we have discovered over time. Um, I, oftentimes people are very protective of their recipes. Right? If you look around this room, if you ask people to go to a party and you say bring a dish, a lot of people will bring their sort of special dish and they don't want anybody else to bring that dish. So they are kind of sometimes uh, protective about these recipes. In economics, we sometimes think about these things as trade secrets, right? It's a type of intellectual property. It's not unlike patents and copyrights and trademarks, things like that. Uh, different ways of uh, protecting intellectual property. Um, so we have these recipes, uh, and as we think about starting to mix these things together, and on my, uh, my little table here, it might be good to sort of just sort of imagine this as opposed to me physically doing this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, notice that I brought uh, a few different bags of, uh, of brown sugar. Uh, there's dark brown sugar and, and light brown sugar. Suppose I had forgotten these, right? Suppose I had no brown sugar, and I was standing in my kitchen, and I thought, ah, I'm out of brown sugar. Uh, what can you use as a substitute for brown sugar? 
Yeah, that's Canadian, good. Uh, anything else that you can use as a good substitute for brown sugar? Honey, okay, so, so what's that? White sugar and? Molasses, yes, very good. So molasses and brown sugar are a very good substitute for, uh, sorry, molasses and white granulated sugar are a very good substitute for brown sugar. Uh, there are lots of these sorts of substitutes, like, uh, for example, the eggs here. Uh, had, I, had I forgotten the eggs, right? Um, uh, sometimes you can use things like bananas or applesauce or whatever, and you know, it, it can pass. If you make omelets, you don't want to use the applesauce, right? Uh, but, you know, in a pinch, you can do these things. This is what we call input substitutability in economics, right? Um, right now, a lot, of, uh, a lot of your friends are probably worried about whether robots are going to take over and take their jobs and things, right? And so when we think of labor and capital or humans and robots, it's not unlike switching different brands of sugar or, or moving from white granulated sugar to, uh, to brown granulated sugar. Um, all of these ingredients have a purpose. So when you think about mixing them together, the, they, uh, some of them you know, provide body. The, the, the baking soda provides airiness, right? It gives you fluffy cookies. Uh, when you get to mixing in the fat, whether you're using you know, butter or lard or margarine or whatever, uh, if you use warm butter, do you know what happens to your cookies? Yeah, very good. You, 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 you're, you're overachieving today. This is great. I love it. You're in the front row. Always happens, right? So, you know, so hot butter spreads, or if you use cold butter straight out of the fridge, your cookies stay in more of a lump, right? So there's sort of a, there's a little art and science to doing this. Um, uh, when you, uh, when you, um, let's see here. Uh, as we start to measure these things, as we start to take these things and put them in the bowl, there's also sort of an art to, to measuring things. So what's the difference between measuring flour and measuring brown sugar? You have to pack brown sugar, very good. So if you sort of sprinkle in the brown sugar, right, and then you pack in the flour, your recipe's gonna be off. Your, your, your cookies are going to taste a little funny. Uh, last week, no, two weeks ago, I was, uh, I was doing this at, a, at another, uh, another res hall across campus, um, and I saw some really fancy schmancy butter on sale. It's like eight bucks a pounder instead of the normal five. And I thought, oh, this is great, right? Um, so I, I, I got some, and I brought it in there, and we made cookies, and uh, learning by doing, right, I discovered through a little trial and error, uh, that uh, fancy schmancy butter often has a, a slightly lower water content. Um, so your cookies may end up a little drier than you plant. Um, so you learn lots of things by trial and error. That's another big economic lesson. Some economists will call these economies of experience. You learn, you get better. So whether you are playing a flute solo or learning how to spike a volleyball or learning how to make cookies, every time you do it, you get a little bit better. You become a little more efficient. You waste fewer cookies. All right, you figure out where's the hot spot in the oven. You figure out how to scoop things off the, off the tray and so you drop, don't drop too many. Um, and so you get better each time you do this. Turns out there are lots of these little economies of things. So economies of experience are one. Economies of scale have a lot to do with baking cookies as well. Uh, so for example, rather than baking four batches, right, like, like uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, one batch a night, it probably makes sense to bake four batches right now. And there's a, there's a compelling reason for that, right? Uh, what do you think that is? Why would it be better to make four batches now rather than one, two, three, four spread out? What's a good economic reason for the two or three of you who are in my class? <laughs> Clean up, yeah, that's right. Clean up sucks, right? So you have to sort of get out all these things, right? And you have to you know, heat up the oven. And then at the end, you have to put everything away and you have to wash your drying racks and all that. And it'd be nice to just wash them once, right? It's sort of a fixed cost you have to incur or just sort of a, you know, something that, that you have to do. And it'd be better to do that once rather than four times. 
You know, some of you in this room, you maybe have not made cookies before, but maybe you've done laundry, and you know that it makes sense to have four loads of laundry going at once rather than one a night for four nights. Economies of scale. We also have something called economies of scope. Uh, economies of scope is the idea that um, oftentimes it makes sense to uh, use common inputs uh, to make related outputs. So for example, uh, I could make little chocolate chip cookie, uh, chocolate chip versions of my oatmeal cookies. I could put in some M&Ms, right? I could go with the straightforward raisins or I could just stick with the plain oatmeal. And if I already have all my equipment going, it sort of makes more sense to, to sort of double up and diversify within my little kitchen as opposed to having two kitchens going at once, right? So it's the same sort of idea. All right, so let's see here. So usually when we uh, do this, uh, we're doing the, uh, the shortened version today, uh, but you know, we'll start going and we'll, we'll get some uh, audience participation going. So I usually get uh, a couple bowls, right? And we walk up and we, we have people come on up and we ask people, you know, can you, uh, can you do a little, little stirring here for me? Very good. Uh, this gives me a good uh, chance to talk about things like outsourcing, right? <laughs> So uh, rather, than, <laughs> rather than doing everything myself, right, I could hire people even better yet, right? If I could get them to volunteer, it would be wonderful. Uh, as you mix these things, right, there's sort of a natural way to do this. You know, a lot of people just sort of find a way to do it. And so, okay, do what you do. Okay, very good, very good. Now switch hands. Like, put it in the other hand. All right, there you go. Yeah, so do it like lefty style, right? And so it kind of, how's it feel? Terrible. Yeah, it's sort of awkward, right? So there's something about like there sort of might be a natural way of doing things and, and um, maybe not, not quite as natural uh, if you did this for six hours a day, right? We do this a lot on campus. You could come around with me. Um, you would get better at it. You would get skilled, right? And so, okay, very good. Thank you. Wow, you've done a very nice job. Very good. Uh, also very nice. Okay. Um, so into these two bowls, since we've uh, just sort of uh, creamed some butter and we've put some other stuff in there, uh, you know, usually we mix it with the brown sugar, but let's talk brown sugar. Uh, we have dark brown sugar and light brown sugar. At my, at my uh, uh, presentation last week, this like blew somebody's mind. Like, I didn't know there were two different kinds. I'm like, yeah, this is great, isn't it? Um, you know, if you get some molasses, we could make some really dark sugar. Uh, so this is, one, this is another thing economists do, right? We, uh, we do something that we like to call comparative statics. Right? If you're a finance person, you might call it like sensitivity analysis. But what we might do is we might make two batches of cookies right next to each other and see what happens, see how they're different. Right? If you use uh, light brown in one and dark brown in another, or if you use butter in one and margarine in the other, or melted butter versus cold straight out of the fridge butter. Right? And you can sort of see what happens. There are some wonderful little um, pictures online if you go to a, uh, an online search at some, some unknown search engine, and you, you can pull up lots of little pictures uh, where people have done this. There are some great websites where people bake the same recipe like 25 different times, just slightly change at you know, it, it every time. Uh, and, and that way you can learn you know, uh, how, how each little assumption affects your model. So economists are big on models. Uh, we like to use models, we like to build models. Um, so another thing we're here to talk about a little bit is, uh, is research. So I'm, I'm the first year advisor. So every year at our university, there's about 500 little ones who come in. Um, and so there's a stream of about 500 little freshlings and they come in and we talk about economics. But I give them a pep talk about, you know, you know do a lot of stuff while you're here. And one of the things you can do is, is start a research project. Um, do some independent research and that's sort of scary, right? Uh, kind of like baking cookies is scary. But I say, you know what, doing research is a heck of a lot like baking cookies. I'm like, how, how so? It's like, well, you know, once you bake a batch of cookies, you sort of recognize what the core ingredients are. Like most real cookies have butter, flour, sugar, and like eggs in them, right? And then everything else is just sort of window dressing, right? You can have M&Ms or raisins or whatever, or sprinkle sugar on top or whatever, but sort of the core stuff. Writing a research paper is a lot like figuring out a new cookie recipe. So we sometimes talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and thinking about the research that came before us. So imagine going to a cookbook 
and pulling out four recipes. All right, and you say, okay, these are all leading cookie recipes. Let's print them all out and put them right next to each other. What do they all have in common? Interesting, all right? Flour, 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 flour. Sugar, 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 sugar. Hmm. All right, so if I'm going to make cookies, maybe I should put flour in it. Maybe I should put sugar. There's sort of like a, a, a current understanding of cookie making technology. And I could get myself up to speed pretty quickly, um, you know, by reading some of these recipes. Um, and then I could think about how to add my own little flourish, how to add uh, my little level of originality. Um, and so even though sometimes starting a research project seems like a very intimidating thing, you have to write a 50-page paper or something, just think of it like little baby steps. Well, what, what inspires me? What makes me, you know, makes me passionate? Oh, I love cookies. All right, so, you know, so what, uh, how could we take our understanding and, and, you know, push it a little further? In fact, if I'm so passionate about cookies, maybe I should do this for a living. All right, this whole professor stuff, eh, you know, it has its ups and downs. Uh, I, could, uh, I could maybe be a cookie guy, right? Uh, and, and what would I need to, to go into the cookie market? Well, I'd probably want to go out there and, and ask people, you know, like, what do you like in a cookie? You know, what uh, do you like in a cookie? I'm going to pick on you guys. What do you like in a cookie? Chocolate. Chocolate, good. Peanut butter, Peanut butter? good. All right, well, what else inspires you about cookies? Not only the ingredients, but whatever. Uh, crunch. Color, crunch, very good. Okay. Uh, richness. Okay, all right, very good. So you can have like the healthy cookies, right? It's like, why Bob, right? Um, okay. Okay, chewy, chewy, all right. So it's sort of like the mouthfeel, right? There's all sorts of things that could be neat about cookies. And so if you had the power to design your own recipe and, and go out in the business world, you could think, all right, well, I'm going to make cookies my way. Now, you're probably not alone in that world, right? So there are some other folks who might like to make cookies, right? There's some nice people up at the uh, Nabisco, uh, sorry, that the uh, National Biscuit Company, right? The little Oreo people. Uh, there's Lorna, of course. Right? Um, and you might think about uh, how can I differentiate my cookies from theirs? Like, what's, what's my thing? Uh, uh, can I get away with charging a little more so I can eke out a living? And how am I going to convince people that my cookies are better than those? So maybe they're homemade or they're fresh and hot or they're available at three in the morning, right? Um, so I could think about differentiating my product. I might go out there and think about what I could get away with charging, right? I could go out there and research the market and learn about pricing and all that. Um, so, you know, all right, so my assistant has uh, gone off and brought, in some, brought out some cookies. Uh, uh, please come in. Okay, so uh, how are we doing for time? Doing very well. We're short. All right, well, we're getting to the end here. All right, so we have our cookies. This is the very small cookie sheet, but you know, suppose we have some cookies, and you know, I scoop out this big first cookie, and we're all looking at it and admiring it, thinking, whoa, right? And then I just plunk, right? It falls on there, and to make the point, they sort of, right? All right, so I stole this idea from somebody else. But um, inefficiency, waste, dead weight loss, we talk about. The idea that you're, you know, cutting down a tree and not doing anything with it in the world is, you know, missing a tree now. You know, this really hits home, let me tell you, when people have been sitting there, or like when you and your peers have been sitting there, right? And, uh, and finally, after like, you know, half an hour, an hour, I bring out some hot cookies and the first one goes on the floor. Memorable, right? That sticks. Uh, you know, and so we say, all right, come on up, let's try the cookies. Um, and so I often, you know, have a, have a guinea pig come up and... Um, you know, we start feeding him or her cookies, right? And the first one is good, right? And that first cookie really hits the spot. Um, we talk a little bit about compliments, right? We have a nice, fresh, big, uh, cool glass of white milk there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the first cookie is great, and then the second cookie, and then, you know, we sort of keep having the person eating cookies. And the smile, you know, let's turn that smile upside down, right? And so eventually it's like, all right, We've hit the satiation level, right? Um, so we can teach a little bit about things like marginal utility or util like utility, satisfaction, happiness, and how one more cookie gives you like a little more happiness. But if you keep eating cookies, then that little extra happiness 
just kind of shrinks away and kind of levels off and eh, it might actually go down, right? You might start getting a tummy ache, right? Uh, who likes cookies more, right? You know, like, I don't know, like, like how, do you, how do you sort of gauge utility and who likes cookies more? That's sort of an interesting philosophical question, certainly worthy of research, right? Um, so, uh, there are many, many things that you can do this. I often have a handout of uh, the top 40 things. So we talk about this price signal quality. We talk about marginal productivity. If I bring you up here to help you or help me, right, how you might all start bonking elbows and getting in each other's way. Uh, we talk about job training and why you might want to do this when you grow up. All sorts of good stuff. Inefficiency, utility, complements, substitutes, uncertain quality. Why do you trust me? Right? Why, like, like, did I wash my hair and my hands? Like, how do you know that I'm not poisoning you? So we have this thing about agency. So we talk about moral hazard and the idea that when you hire somebody to fix your roof or to bake you cookies, you're sort of trusting that they do a good job. Uh, we might talk about regulation and why the government might want to step in and police these sorts of things. Um, so, as you can see, there are lots and lots of fun things that you can do with this sort of experiment. I've done it numerous times. Every time is an adventure. Uh, one time I wasn't in my kitchen, I didn't have my scissors and everything, so why don't I just use a sharp slash dull knife to open this bag and I immediately cut myself and started bleeding all over the place. Had to wrap up, you know, had, you always bring a towel, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I wrapped up, it's kind of, keep that part behind your back, right? Don't startle the, the crowd. Um, but, uh, but I encourage you, uh, this is one of those presentations that's kind of fun because if we have a zombie apocalypse or the, you know, the, uh, the uh, power goes out and you can't, you know, you can't uh, turn on your computer, you still might want to cook, you still might want to eat, and you still might want to teach people about economics. All right, thank you. <laughs>